Okay, so uh, what, what, here's what we're looking to do because we couldn't possibly cover everything in one hour. Not possible. So one of the things we'll end on is resources, both with CalAble, Golden State Pool Trust, and that kind of thing. So this will be kind of an introduction. Carrie's going to start off talking about CalAble, and she just was told that recently, so here we go. And then I'm going to fill in behind, and then uh, hopefully we'll have something different. Yeah, we'd love to be able to leave some time for questions because I'm sure. So do yeah. you want to do the whole? Thing? Yeah, I was going to ask. Do you, what do you prefer? Four questions at the end, or if we can, yeah, almost always the answer will be in the next slide. Yep. I'm just <laughs> here to tell great. you. So, so if we could do that, then we can plow through this and leave at least 15 minutes for questions. Maybe take some notes. Or until they throw us out of here. You know, so but we're officially done in now. So it's and it's just uh, by all means up down. Okay. okay. Well, thanks everyone for having me. Uh, my name is Carrie Fisher Stone, and I am the deputy executive director for the CalAble program. I have been with CalAble since we first got state funding in 2016. Um, I'm also a special needs parent, so my son has a CalAble account. Um, he has autism and Tourette's, and so in my instance, I'm kind of using his CalAble account as a long-term savings vehicle for him, kind of similar to a college savings account. Um, don't know what his future necessarily holds, but with ABLE accounts, as we'll learn, we can spend um, the ABLE monies on a host of different things, and education is one of those, but there's also several other um, what we call qualified, qualified disability expenses that we can spend our funds on, so if he doesn't go to school, in his case, then I can use it for a host of other things related to his disability to help support him. Um, so as um, was mentioned earlier, um, ABLE, the ABLE Act was a federal law that was passed in 2014, signed by President Obama, and it did exactly what Mary just said. It actually allowed each individual state the opportunity to create its own ABLE program. And what it specifically did was it added a code to, um, I think we're, can I go back one more, or did I miss one? Oh, it's not on there, but that's okay, I can talk about it. Um, it goes into the ABLE Act, typically. What it actually did, the Act, is it created what we call Section 529A in the tax code. So, college savings accounts are known as 529 accounts. We might be familiar with those. In California, that program is ScholarShare. Um, ABLE accounts are 529A accounts, so the same kind of um, thing applies. These are tax advantage savings and investment account, uh, accounts when used for qualified disability expenses. So in the case of college savings, the qualified expense is expenses related to education. With ABLE, they are these qualified disability um, expenses. Um, CalAble is the name of our program. I'll talk about the fact that you know there are 40 other states that are actually um, operating ABLE programs, and we do in many cases have the opportunity to enroll in another state's program, and vice versa. We're a national program, um, so that means that residents from other states are able to um, enroll in our program, and that's a good thing for all states, I would say, because um, the more people we have in the plan, the more economy of scale. We ultimately have the opportunity to lower fees for this program, which I'll go into. Um, but, you know, depending on, a, on individual circumstances, people may have a reason to go into another state's plan. Most of these work the same way, but there are some little differences in terms of cost, in terms of investment options, different features. Some plans have a debit card, some don't. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, our program, just so you have an understanding of the structure, is actually administrated well, we actually report to a seven-member board. So the California ABLE Act board is its own state agency. Um, and we are administered out of the state treasurer's office. And that's because the state treasurer serves as the chair of that board. And so it's also a unique um, structure that gives us an advantage, I think, over some other states as well. We have some ex officio members on that board, um, state controller, state treasurer, uh, Department of Finance, so those financial oversight agencies are on our board, but we also have representatives from all of the different state agencies that administer disability services in those programs. So Department of uh, Rehabilitation, Department of Developmental Services, 
State Independent Living Council, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, those individuals are on our board as well. And so they really did a great job in helping make sure that we were communicating with our constituents as the program was formed. They gave us a lot of um, feedback, helped provide a lot of um, direction, and they have continual oversight over the program. So that's another, um, a lot of the other state programs are kind of just run out of their state treasury. So we do have those representatives from the disability community that are on our board. And as Mary also said, we're very newly launched. We launched December 18th officially. We're doing excellent. We're just a little into two months now. We already have almost 700 accounts open, um, which is great. People say, why did it take, you know, Calable so long to get up and running? Sometimes that's a red flag for people. And the reason is that, you know, in California, these plans require us to contract with third party financial firms. In our case, um, the program manager is a firm called TIAA CREF, which some of you may be familiar with. But we had to procure that firm through a competitive bidding process. So we go out to bid, we see who bids on our contract. Um, we, had, we had to do that three times. And that was because California has a really high standard of care with its contracting of third parties. So we needed to make sure that whoever responded to the, to the contract or who did it um, was going to meet that high level of liability. And until we could get that, we couldn't launch the program. And so that's really the only reason there was a holdup. We were the 40th state to launch. The other advantage of that is that we got to see several states go before us and we had a lot of lessons learned about what was working, what wasn't. So not first out of the gate, but, but not a bad thing. <clears throat> Just really briefly, I always like to highlight our vision and mission only because, um, you know, we didn't create these in a conference room, kind of in a silo. Um, while we had to wait to get up and going, we spent about two years going out into the community, holding meetings such as this. We did some with Ski, where we went out and asked people, you know, what do you want to see in this program? Um, how do you envision this best working for you? What features are important to you? And really wanted that partnership and that feedback from our constituents. So our vision is to provide greater financial security to Californians living with a disability. The mission is to meet the diverse needs of our customers and their families. We pledge to be customer driven, accountable, and a trusted partner in providing financial services. And I will say, CalAble, you know, we field calls every day. Um, we, we really strive to provide a high level of customer service and not just sort of pass the buck. If, if there's an issue, sometimes this gets complicated in terms of the interplay with benefits. Um, you know, special needs trust. We want to help you find the resource or the person who can best help you. Um, and really building that trust as well. This is a program, we go out and people still say, I can't believe that this is real. I can't believe that you can actually now save more than $2,000 and keep your benefits. And so we realize this is a huge culture, cultural shift for folks. It's gonna get folks sometimes use some time to get used to it. We've seen throughout the country, the uptake with, with ABLE accounts has actually been really slow. And part of it is building that trust factor and, and letting folks understand, no, your assets in this program um, are protected and, and you can keep your benefits. Uh, our values, same thing. I would really emphasize trust and collaboration. We wanna collaborate as much as possible especially as a government program. Sometimes there's some distrust of how a government program is, is running. Sometimes we don't always involve the, the participation of the people who will be using it. We want to be different in that sense. We want to partner with you guys to, to really make this work. All right, so we'll talk nuts and bolts really quick. Eligibility. Who's eligible? Uh, a person whose onset of their disability occurred before the age 26 is currently eligible. There's some other criteria which I'll go into, but I do want to speak to the age cap. A lot of folks ask, why is it capped at 26? Obviously, that you know excludes a good number of people. It was just an arbitrary number that was set at the federal level when they went to, to, to compromise on the federal legislation. This is a tax advantage program, and so the thought was, if everybody with a disability is participating, we're going to see a, a pretty significant loss in tax revenue, right? Um, there are efforts to increase this age to 46. There's been a bill introduced into Congress. It's called the ABLE uh, Age Adjustment Act. Hasn't had a ton of traction, so um, we do we do try to advocate for that and encourage other folks to advocate for that because it would you know help a lot more people be able to participate. Um, the other thing I always like to make clear about the age cap is that it is the onset, the age of onset. It's not necessarily diagnosis driven. 
So especially, you know, think about somebody who has a mental illness like schizophrenia, for example. They're diagnosed at 30, but it's clear that the onset of that, right, was likely very much before that. If, you, if that's the type of situation you have, you can actually do um, a self-certification. And what that is, is it's having a licensed physician write a note that says this person has X disability and the onset, or it began prior to the age of 26. And that you could self-certify that way. The program itself, when you go to enroll online, is a self-certifying program. And what you basically will do is check a box that says, I you know, under penalty of perjury, I, I meet the criteria um, for this. With regard to the doctor's note, it's something we tell you to keep in, on hand in your files in the event that you're ever audited. Um, the SSA and the IRS have the ability to audit these accounts. We're not going to collect your doctor's note. Um, so it's just we tell people, hang on to that, keep it in your files in the event you ever need to prove your eligibility. <clears throat> Um, assuming you meet that age criteria, if you are eligible or receiving either SSI or SSDI benefits, you're automatically um, eligible. Self-certification is not necessarily needed for you. Um, in terms of finding out which conditions you can self-certify with, we refer folks to a couple of different listings. Those are the SSA's list of compassionate allowances or their blue book listings. So again, if you're, if you're wanting to self-certify um, and you want to see if you qualify, looking at those lists, and then again, you want to be meeting that age criteria. Does that sound right, Steve? Absolutely. <laughs> and Steve, Steve is the expert. It's a little intimidating doing this in front of him. So if you need to rectify anything, please, please. I said to keep in mind, since everybody in this room here dealing you know, with a developmental disability, this should be a piece of paper. Yeah. If, if your loved one was getting SSI or SSDI or anything before age 18, you can just space this out. Yep. Thanks. There you go. Okay. We'll talk a little bit how about contributions into these accounts and how they're funded. Um, so as we all know, before the ABLE Act, you could only have 2,000, right, in uh, resources without impacting your social security and other means tested programs. I think it's 3,000 for, for a couple, 2,000 for an individual, 3,000 for a couple. It's been that way since 1985. Right. And so now with the ABLE Act, what we said was, or what they said was you can now save um, up to 15,000 per year. That's a contribution, annual contribution cap. So um, $15,000 a year and that you can contribute, and you can ultimately save up to $100,000 eventually. It's going to take some time to get there at $15,000 per year. Um, and before your Social Security, uh, a supplemental security insurance, your SSI, is suspended. Okay, so that $100,000 cap is really specific to SSI benefits. If you hit that $100,000, they will suspend your benefits. You don't lose your eligibility for SSI, but your benefits would be suspended until you got back under that $100,000 balance. Um, you can, if you're investing, obviously, accrue interest in these accounts. So that's okay. If you're putting, you know, grandma puts in $15,000 for the year, you're earning interest, that's okay, right? Your, your benefits are going to be protected. Um, in California, so every, Calif um, every state has a different total contribution cap. <clears throat> for its ABLE plan, and it's actually, in statute, the reason they're differing numbers is that the federal law says that whatever the state's college savings or 529 cap is shall be the same for ABLE. And so in California, it's 529,000 total that you could actually um, accrue in these accounts if you're not worried about your SSI. If SSI is not a concern, you could actually save up to 529 and keep your Medi-Cal, um, any other means, you know, means-tested benefit, essentially. So that 100000 is very specific to, to SSI. Did you want to add anything? On well, the only thing I would add to that, just real quickly, is that for folks that are developmentally disabled, which it has to be before the age of 18, so under the law, if your child is disabled before the age of 22, I wish they all had the same number because it gets confusing. Mm -hmm. But 18 is before 22, so that, that works out. Your child will not be on SSI in most cases when you retire or become disabled. 
of that sort of thing. So like, let's say you had a child that's 45 and you're doing this. Odds are before you hit the 100,000, you're gonna go on social security, your child's gonna go on a program called Childhood Disability Benefits, and they're not gonna be on SSI anyway. The takeaway with this is, you know, <coughs> they built this to be a simple program. Simple and disability are two words that do not go together. Um, I wish they did, but they don't. So really, in a lot of cases, you wanna really analyze your situation because it could be that the 100,000 means something that may not be. And I'm gonna be covering um, uh, different uses. Sometimes it's a savings plan, sometimes it's a distribution plan, sometimes it's both, sometimes it's either. What is it? We're still figuring that out. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> and the other thing I'll just say is that our system was designed to automatically reject any excess contributions. So you don't necessarily have to worry about, uh, you know, oops, I went over my limit. If you're getting <coughs> close, you're going to get a notification that tells you you're, you're getting close. <coughs> Um, this was able to work was a provision that was added as a part of federal tax reform a year ago. Um, they had a couple of, of uh, provisions in there that were beneficial to ABLE programs. Um, this is called ABLE to Work and what it does is it says that if the beneficiary is employed, then they have the ability to save over that $15,000 of their own earnings um, up to whichever is less. And it's either an amount equal to their annual gross salary or the current federal poverty uh, level, which for this calendar year is uh, 12140 So that means, say, uh, Johnny, the beneficiary, makes $11,000 a year, then he could save up to 15 plus 11 uh, a year. Now, again, the 15 is any you know contribution including third party contributions the additional 11 would be from that individual's earnings so it doesn't automatically raise the cap you know to 26 or 27 and anybody can contribute it really is um tracked to that person's earnings um and then yeah i think there's a potential here to you know save up to 27 140. Just a couple of basics, so different from college savings where you can have multiple accounts. With an ABLE account, ABLE account you can only have one. Um, some individuals have been deciding to roll over, who have accounts in other states have been deciding to roll over to CalABLE. Um, there's like a 60 day window, I think, where you can do that, where you can have both accounts open because to initiate that process, you do have to establish a CalABLE account, um, but only one account eventually. Um, the beneficiary is always the account owner, so this is their account. The, the account is in the beneficiary's name. Um, so assuming the person has capacity to manage their own account, and again, kind of we get into some gray areas, but um, then if they can open and manage their own account, they, they do that. If they don't have the ability to do that, there are a few individuals who can open and manage an account on their behalf. We call that an authorized legal representative. Um, and that is either a parent, legal guardian, uh, power of attorney. So it's pretty specific. And um, you know, it does exclude some folks like rep payees as an example. There's been some discussion about potentially broadening that category at the federal level, but honestly, uh, conversations haven't gone too far because there's concerns about fraud and other things. And I know we can speak to this in even more detail because in California, it's a little more complicated in terms of the conservator laws and who really can be doing this. Um, but that is what we have right now, is the parent, legal guardian, technically conservator of the estate right now, right? It's a great area. It's a great area. Uh, power of attorney. Um, I always like to make clear, too, that these accounts are asset shields. They're asset protected. Um, some folks, several actually, will call and they think, well, if I am receiving any kind of income and I direct it to my ABLE account, then I'm not going to have to take any penalty um, to my SSI or, or other um, benefit. And that's not the case. So when any income hits, that formula for income for SSI is still going to apply. Once the money is in your ABLE account, then it's protected as a resource. So what that means is that, you know, for the resource testing piece, they will disregard the ABLE account. And maybe you could say this better. Well, no, it's protected there, but it's also has that. 
but it's it, it's 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 not counted for any need space program. Right. Um, yeah, any federal cut, state. Although apparently they're yeah. they're cut. Yeah, we have some issues with getting HUD to release guidance that will verify that they will not um, count ABLE accounts when they're determining eligibility. The law is pretty clear that they can't. Um, it's just that folks have been afraid to open an account until, you know, this is also an education effort because HUD has not told their people on the ground about ABLE or how this works or how they should handle it, and they have to refer to their current procedures. Um, some folks have, have really hesitated to open an account until that gets sorted out. There's lots of folks working on this HUD issue. State treasurers, uh, office, treasury offices across the country are some of the ma more major disability advocacy organizations are all trying to push HUD to release that guidance. We've been working on it for two years and we're making calls all the time. I just made a call last week to some reg director in DC and said, hey, can, who can we get in front of? So we are, we are working on that issue. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, Steve is going to talk about this too. You know, these accounts can really function in different ways. Like I said, I'm using mine for long-term savings for my kiddo. Other people will use these for day-to-day -day living expenses. Um, you're able to do that with, and you know, more transactional, like a savings or a checking account. Um, and again, these monies are tax exempt as long as they are spent on QDEs. So what is a qualified disability expense or QDE? It's very broad. Um, it's specifically any expense related to the designated beneficiary as a result of living a life with disabilities that helps maintain or improve your health, independence, or quality of life. So that's pretty darn broad. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. There are um, I listed some specific categories. We have a fact sheet over there, by the way, that we can pass out that kind of breaks down the specific categories that are listed, but even basic living expenses are considered a qualified disability expense. We were just talking about this. People want to say, well, what's not a QDE? And it's very difficult to say what we can tell gambling yeah, illegal <laughs> drugs. The question is, is cannabis a QDE? <laughs> she, works, she works for the treasurer's office. <laughs> You can take what's called a non-QDE. It's not by any means illegal, but if you do decide to take money out of this account for something other than a QDE, assuming we know what it is, um, then your expense is then subject to regular taxes. There's also some tax penalties. 10% federal tax penalty, and I think a 2.5% state tax penalty. And then your benefits may be at risk. <coughs> uh, really briefly on how Cal Able works in terms of taking money out. Um, and I'll go into our system is an online system. It's entirely online. There's no paper application. Um, it, it's for a purpose. Some people, you know, have been unhappy with the fact that we don't have a paper application, but the online system, for one, it's cost effective so for the long-term viability of the plan you know all of the other states are pretty much operating in this way they, it's it's a very similar online enrollment process it's very quick it's very easy people who don't have access to computers we say try to find a friend or friend family member library you know some of our disability service provider partners have told us that they will help folks get an internet connection so that they can they can get online. But anyway, once you are in the system, uh, you can withdraw money as frequently as you like. There's no limit. There's no charge on any money that you're taking out unless you are um, having checks just, uh, um, written from the account. I think it's a $5 per check fee. We'll go into our fees in just a moment. Um, again, we are not asking um, what you're going to spend your money on. Uh, again, the IRS could do that, so we're not going to be tracking your expenses. We're not going to ask for any receipts. You'll want to hang on to your own receipts in the event that you're ever audited and you need to make a case for why you spent the money you did. Um, but in terms of moving the money, um, ACH transfers electronically, so you go in and you say, I want to withdraw $50. You enter your bank, you know, a checking or a savings account number, and it's a pretty quick process to transfer those funds. Again, you can also have checks sent from the accounts to third parties as well. So um, that ability is there too. And coming soon for CalABLE is a prepaid debit card. 
And so what will that, that will allow you to, it's not an ATM card that has access to your entire account. It's a loadable card. So like in my instance, you know, Riley, I would like him eventually, maybe he wants to go spend his own money um, with his friends. You know, I can go on, I could load as his authorized legal representative, I could go in, I could load 30 bucks on his, on his prepaid card and say, here, now he can go to the movies, he can go buy a coffee, whatever. So there is that protection so that yeah, you're really careful with that. But then once you have the debit card, you can use it pretty much anywhere that way. <clears throat> Our fees are on par, they're pretty low fees. They're on par with other state uh, programs and I'll go into those in just a moment. Again, the process itself to get online and do it is free. Um, there will be a $25 minimum deposit when you do open your account. Um, contributions and deposits, so money coming in, again, electronic tra uh, fund transfers, ACH, you can do it one time, you can do it recurring. In my situation, every month I have um, $50 coming out of my checking account into my kiddo's ABLE account. It just happens. It's very easy. Um, again, check, you could have checks sent into um, the plan as well. We also have a feature called e-gifting, which is similar to like a GoFundMe, if you're familiar with that, where you can do some crowdfunding. Um, say, you know, Riley's having a birthday and I want to, um, you know, instead of a gift, would you like to donate to, to his ABLE account? Then I could, from the system, send out a link to friends, family members, would you like to make a contribution? And the money can be directly deposited that way. Um, sometimes people are crowdfunding for like a big expense, like a wheelchair or something. Help me reach my goal of, you know, and you can invite them to contribute to the account that way. Um, we have just four investment options with our plan. Other states have different types of investment options. A lot of them are the same um, types of funds, but, um, you know, a state like, Tennessee, Nebraska has like 17 investment options. So that's where you start to see some of the differences. We try to keep it as simple as possible, at least to start um, for our constituents. <clears throat> one thing I want to make clear about our plan, uh, one of the benefits of investing in CalAble as opposed to another state is that we did something here um, legislatively that's going to help our California residents have some protection from a clawback from Medi-Cal. So if some of you are familiar with Medicaid payback provisions, Steve's an expert on this and can talk about this, but essentially there was a, there's a piece in the federal law that says that states have the ability um, to file a claim against the beneficiary's account after their passing to be repaid for any medical that was spent on them. It's during the lifetime of the account. And obviously this was not popular with ABLE. A lot of people said, well, here, you know, here they go. They want to take my money away. You know, there's got to be a catch, right? Um, and so knowing that folks weren't necessarily going to, and that's part of why the uptake has been slow too around the country. Um, we did pursue legislation. We're now one of five states who offers that protection for our residents. So if you're a California resident with a CalAble account, Medicaid or Medi-Cal cannot file that claim specifically against your ABLE account. Um, and it works the same. It, it, keep in mind the way our law was written, if you live in California and you have an Ohio account, theoretically, whether they would or not, um, Medi-Cal could file a claim against that Ohio account and vice versa. If you're living in Ohio, you have a CalAble account, we can't do anything about that because their state Medicaid folks could you know, file a claim against the account. Um, so that is a big protection for our folks. If Medi-Cal is an issue for you, I think then it, it's worthwhile to transfer back over to um, California. We had some other, um, we had another law passed that actually protects our accounts from, it, it offers some protection against creditors, specifically the enforcement of money judgments. Just briefly again, tax reform gave us some um, positive changes to ABLE. The ABLE to work was one I mentioned. We also now are able to uh, roll over, say you opened up a 529 college savings account for your kiddo, the kiddo became uh, disabled, you can now actually transfer those funds into an ABLE account for that individual. Um, we also got access to something called the Savers Credit, um, depending on your income level. There's the ability here to, you know, when you go to file your taxes, to apply for up to um, $2,000 in a tax credit. There's different criteria for that, and 
Um, it's pretty detailed. Probably the best bet would be to talk to a certified um, tax advisor. Okay, so here's our fees. Um, every plan in the country charges what we call the account maintenance fee. This is really just the cost of running the program. Um, it's an, uh, this is an annual charge, $37 per year. This is assessed monthly. So per month, you're seeing a little bit over $3 come out of your account. Um, and the range there in other states, it's anywhere from zero if you were lucky enough to be a state like Tennessee, which got a full appropriation um, to run their program. Um, to about $60 per year is kind of the range you'll see in the market. <clears throat> we operate here in California on general fund loans, um, and um, we have to pay those loans back. So we are not as fortunate in that sense. But again, the more people we get into the plan, it will drive down the cost of our fees over time. We also have what's called an underlying investment fee. <clears throat> so that's going to depend on the investment uh, option that you select, and we have four. Uh, we have an FDIC insured option, so this is kind of your savings account, checking account option, right? Um, you have the ability to earn a little bit of interest, but your principal is protected. Your money is going to be there. Um, there's zero fees if you're enrolling in the FDIC insured option. And again, this would probably probably be the uh, way you wanted to go if you were going to use this more transactionally, more you know for daily day-to-day uh, -day expenses. If you're going to invest in one of the other investment options, we have a conservative, a moderate, and an aggressive portfolio. Um, if you really want the nitty gritty on investments, our website does a pretty good job of going into that, um, where you can actually see underlying funds, what are the holdings, you know, who are the companies, you can really, what's the performance like, you can really get into that if you want to. Um, but there are what we call asset-based fees on those investments. Um, they range anywhere from zero point, 08 to 0.10% of the assets in your account. So it's based on how much money, it's a percentage of how much money you have in your account. Um, the state administrative fee is also a basis point fee. That's at 0.44%. And again, it's, it's a portion of the assets, percentage of the assets in your account. That state administrative fee is what's paying back our general fund loans. Um, and then additional fees depending on different circumstances. If you elect to have paper statements sent to you, they're going to charge you $10 a year. Um, if you check, a check bounces, they're going to charge you $20. And again, that check issuance fee, $5. Let me help break this down just so people can kind of visualize what this can potentially add up to. So this chart is assuming you have $3,000 in your Calable account. Um, you've enrolled in the FDIC option. Your cost for the year is $37 for the year in your fees. Um, say like you're, you've done what I've done and you're investing in that aggressive option, right? And you know, um, you have $3,000 in, in the account, then you're going to be looking at about $52 per year in fees. So just to give you an idea, as the, you know, the fees do go up as the as the assets are accumulated. Talked about, so all of our funds, by the way, are managed by TIA CREF. Um, we don't have any Vanguard funds or Fidelity funds. Other plans do have some somewhat more of a mix. Um, that could change over time as well. Again, this is what they proposed when they've been on our contract, so that's what we have right now. Um, could change over time. The other thing to note about investments is that you have the ability to change your investment option up to twice per year. So say you started out in an FDIC insured option. Nah, I think I want to do some, you know, um, some investing. Then you would have the option twice to go in and change that. And you do also have the ability to spread out your investment. So I took a screenshot of what it looks like on the enrollment website. In this scenario, you know, you've, you're you're designating your, you've put some money in, you made a contribution, and you're designating now where you want it to go. And in this case, I've got 25% going to the conservative, 25 to the moderate, 50 to the aggressive. You could do 100% in the aggressive. You could do 50-50. So you do have the ability to spread it out. Okay, when you get to our website, our enrollment website, this is what you're going to see. We're at calable.ca.gov. I do recommend that people kind of do some clicking around and read read up on the different items there. 
Um, but when you are ready to eventually open your account, it's pretty darn easy. You see a yellow button down here that says open an account. And, you know, I did this process. It took me about 10 to 15 minutes to sign up for my son, to sign up his, uh, for his account. Um, it'll tell you right here that you'll need a few pieces of information to start. This is kind of your basic, you know, social security number, contact information. Um, if you're going to have an authorized legal representative, that person needs to have a social security number because they're going to do an identity verification of that person. And then again, any bank account information, um, account numbers, bank routing numbers, if you're going to be transferring funds. Um, if you need help with our enrollment process, as I said, it is pretty straightforward, but um, these folks at our customer call center are really good about walking people through the enrollment process. They are also the same folks who have serviced other plans um, for the last few years. So they're not necessarily new, we're new, but they know very much how this process works and can answer any questions for you. Uh, there's a number there, email address. I always like to make reference to the ABLE National Resource Center. These folks are an arm of the National Disability Institute out of DC, and they have excellent resources on ABLE, tons of information, tons of webinars. Steve just did a webinar with them. Um, all kinds of topics, how to use your ABLE account with a special needs trust, for example. They also have a state comparison tool. So if you want to check out what's going on in other states, you could say, you know, pick three states, California, Oregon, Ohio. Now let's see, what are their fees? What are their investment options? What special features do they have? Just briefly, one of the things we want to pursue legislatively is a tax incentive of some sort for people who are contributing to these accounts. There are about 10 other states who do offer some sort of tax deduction or tax credit for their own residents. We would like to do the same. Um, Assemblymember Fong out of Kern County has just yesterday introduced, uh, I think it's AB416. And that would give Cal Able contributors um, a tax deduction in the amount equal to the amount that they contributed. So if you want to help us advocate for that, that would be awesome. Check it out, AB416. If you want to write a letter to your uh, representative, you know, help us advocate for this stuff so that we can make Cal Able the best it can be. The other thing we need to pursue is tax conformity. Um, those rollovers that I mentioned from the 529 college savings into ABLE, currently those are only exempt from federal tax. Um, we need to pursue what's called tax conformity so that our state um, tax laws will match the federal tax laws. So for instance, if you were today to go on and roll over your college savings into ABLE, you'd be looking at, you wouldn't be looking at a federal tax penalty, but there would be a state tax penalty associated with that. So we're trying to remove that. Again, please help us advocate for these things. Um, helping us spread the word. We are three people out of Sacramento, um, trying to get as many places as we can, but um, definitely need the help. Um, we uh, are happy to go out. I tend to take a regional approach. If we can get a couple of folks in one area, we'll go out and hit a couple of different places. So if you're associated with an organization, a nonprofit, a parent group, happy to come out and talk to you guys. We also have an advisory council, a couple of them actually, that meets a couple of times a year. We aim for that at least. Um, where we talk about, you know, Steve is an advisory council member, we come and we talk about what are some issues with ABLE, um, you know, what are, what are some feedback we need, how can we improve this program, are there legislative things we want to explore um, so that everybody can kind of uh, brainstorm together and, and collaborate. And then I'm also going to, going to be launching what we're calling a Cal ABLE ambassador program. So this is just a way for interested, you know, people who are passionate about ABLE, maybe they're using ABLE, they're associated with an organization, um, to help us kind of spread, again, spread the word. I'll be doing kind of a train the trainer similar to this, giving folks tools. Here's information about ABLE. Here's how you sign up for Cal ABLE. Now please go into your networks, you know, whether it's sharing on social media, hosting a meeting, um, and then coming back as well to us and saying, you know, this is going to be an evolving program. What feedback are you hearing? What's working? What's not working? So very much, you know, closing the loop on that. And my contact, I ran out of business cards because we have a new treasurer and we need to order new business cards. Um, so my contact information is on the PowerPoint. And we are on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. That's it. Excellent. I'm going to kind of fill in the blanks a little bit. Let me tell you part of this. I am the trustee of the Golden State Pooled Trust. A pooled trust is a form of a special needs trust. It's kind of like a cross between a 401k 
and a special needs trust. We don't have a lot of time to get into it, but we actually have over 200 beneficiaries uh, here. And part of the issue that we deal with is that we handle the funds, we make the disbursements, and that sort of thing. We have been using ABLE programs. We started using a program from, the, from another state but we will be moving a lot of our accounts over to Cal Able um, here, so there we go. Um, and nobody cares about that. Okay, let me go through a little bit. Um, I'm gonna just hit the highlights. This is gonna be really important because the things I'm gonna cover is I'm gonna cover issues of capacity, I'm gonna cover how have we used this thing, what's worked, what didn't work um, here, and I'm gonna cover something about housing. For, so for those of you that have a loved one on SSI who's getting less than $930 a month, I may be able to show you how to save $3,000 a year. The only problem is I've never figured out how to bill for it, although there's another program that I probably did uh, here, but there you go. Okay, this is gonna be really important as we get into this, no matter who or what puts the money in this, and I'm going to ask you to repeat this several times. Whose money is it? It's the beneficiary's money. Okay, it's that's their money. Okay, and you're going to see that's mostly a good thing. Okay, individuals can maintain eligibility for means-tested programs. The only thing about the hundred thousand dollar thing is, first off, you need to look at your situation because it could be a savings plan. It could be a plan for teaching financial responsibility, it could be a plan for helping with housing, it could be all of the above, one of the above, or whatever. For the most part, for most of you, when you, if you're a parent, when you're on Social Security, when you go to Social Security and start getting that, or you, you get it because of you're disabled, your child will go on childhood disability benefits in almost all cases. So we may not care if they're on SSI or not, you gotta fit into your situation. Here. Uh, during my lifetime, I doubt if I will see a fully funded um, ABLE account with 529000 That's going to be a long way. Um, any person can put funds in the trust. Now, person doesn't mean what you think it is. Really, this is run by the uh, Department of Treasury, the IRS, and they, quite frankly, don't give a damn where the money comes from. It can come from a trust. And there's been a lot on that. And one of the things I will say is something I just did for the April National Network um, Resource Center and about using a special needs trust with it. Um, it is, there is no federal tax deduction. Uh, some states do have state deductions. Uh, Carrie said they're working on it. Income earned by the account is not taxed, just like any normal 529 plan. Withdrawals uh, for qualified expenses are not taxable. We're gonna to touch on that a little bit. And I have to be a little careful because we're being recorded. But um, <laughs> in order to end up um, having somebody determine that it's not a qualified disability expense, your loved one on SSI would have to be audited by the IRS, by an IRS agent who understands ABLE and is doesn't do what they traditionally do, which is bend over backwards anyway. The chance of that is not zero, it's pretty damn close. Okay, it's about as close as you can get. Social Security, on the other hand, not as disability friendly. Once again, they wanna know everything and all that, and if they can find a way to take you, they certainly will. Okay, so you're limited to one account up to the gift tax amount, that's no big thing. Although the thing about it is, so this is one of the drivers. That was set about 1985. If you had the most conservative a uh, cost of living adjustment. That should be, I've seen anywhere from twelve to 18000 Remember in 1985 where you actually could buy things for next to nothing and like a house, you probably could get a house even in Napa for 100000 That's not happening today, right? So things have, things have gone up. <laughs> uh, so anyway, like I said, I guess if, if you're just putting the 15000 in, I'm going to have to hang around for 31.6 years um, here in order to see a fully funded trust. I don't think, I, you know. So this is important. Carrie kind of covered this, but I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into this. Who can establish the account? Who can manage the account? Okay, it's the person with signature authority. New words. Okay, so it's the individual themselves. Now, a lot of what we're going to talk about is capacity, and I just want to say this to begin with, as a disability rights advocate, and I consider myself, you know, um, when you're dealing, like my friend says, uh, Brian Rubin, who's a, uh, an advocate for folks with autism, if you met one person with autism, you have met 
one person with autism. Now, for me, it'd be a lot simpler if they were all the same, but they're not, okay? And so some have extreme uh, capacity to manage things, probably do better than you and I. There's some folks that are nonverbal and maybe have some real issues and can they do this, maybe not. And then there's everything in between, okay? And, and, it's, and it's just kind of like, it's a spectrum, you know, just like autism. Same thing with Down syndrome and all that. And so does your child have capacity? Well, let's figure it out, right? Now, I have two children that are technically not disabled. Do they have capacity managed funds? So they're working on it. <laughs> they're in their 40s. Okay, unless the beneficiary lacks uh, capacity, the first priority to manage the account, regardless of uh, who established the account, is the person with signature authority. So you go back to this. A parent can set up an account, okay? Um, but once your child becomes an adult, if they have capacity, they're able to say, that's my account, I am in charge of it, right? Now, for some people that's cool, for some people that's terrifying, but it's something you just want to take into account. Um, if the eligible uh, uh, individual has capacity, have them sign the power of attorney. I, I was actually involved peripherally in the legislation, not directly, but peripherally, and why they came up with that list, I have absolutely no idea. I was one of the first Californians to open up an ABLE account for my niece in New York, so we're spread all over the place here. Uh, here, and But an uncle can't set it up. We had to do it through Erica's mom. We'll talk about Erica a bit. Um, so if you want somebody else to manage it, you could be somebody with CP maybe who uh, does have capacity, but just, you know, for any number of reasons, just can't really handle uh, making the disbursement. So you would use a power of attorney and, de and designate somebody else, okay? As the trustee of the Golden State Pool Trust, as we talk about some of the things we've done, um, I am the agent for those accounts, right? And, uh, but it just depends on it. Now, this is the way I want to illustrate this, and this is the thing, and, and, and what I'm trying to get across is think about this, okay? So here's our scenario, and you'll see my fascination with cartoons. Okay, Fred and Wilma have a daughter named Pebbles who was born with severe developmental disabilities. Fred and Wilma establish a, it should be a Cal Able account um, here under their authority as Pebbles' parents, okay? Pebbles lacks capacity to manage her account or to execute a power of attorney. Now, before we make that determination, does she really lack capacity? Well, you know, it's more than just an opinion. But let's just take it that in this case, she really doesn't have capacity. Fred and Wilma maintain signature authority as their parents. Parents can do that. Fred and Wilma uh, pass away in a tragic accident, and her neighbors uh, and best friends uh, here, Barney and Betty, set up... Uh, step up to take care of Pebbles, which is really nice. But in order to do that, they would need to either conserve her or adopt her, okay? Now, here's the thing to think about. Now, let's use my niece as an example. I have a niece named Erica. Uh, she is uh, Down syndrome. Now, she's from New York, so she's not the typical Down syndrome um, person. She, she is uh, very New York, so she will tell you to screw off uh, here. Uh, here. But, you know, but that's all good and well. Um, here and we set up an account for her now does she have capacity now you know part of it is can she determine what she wants um, and can she express herself and the answer is absolutely yes and sometimes I wish she wouldn't but she does it anyway uh, here the you know is she ordered to time place and all that she is are we comfortable with her managing fifteen thousand dollars out of pocket no, right? And so what we did in that case, because the reason we did that is, if we go back to Eric, this is a good example. She's been on SSI her entire life. She has never purchased a single thing, not a single thing. And one of the reasons we did that is we thought it might be kind of cool to see if Erica could learn financial literacy. Now, so we got her an account, you know, and she has a card with it. And the first things she bought were incredibly inappropriate. Okay, so we've been working on that. But, you know, the thing about it is how are you going to learn to manage money if you've never managed money? Now, we've gone from incredibly inappropriate to questionable. So we're moving along, you know, the way. But, you know, she, she is like many things with her. She's exceeding our expectations. Right now, just for protections, we have the majority of the money in the special needs trust, and we feed the ABLE account as it goes. That's just one use, but that's one of those things. So if there's a capacity issue, here's the thing you've got to think about in your own world. You know, 
if you have a loved one, really, where you don't have a lot of questions about their managing it uh, here, then you just chuck as much in it as you can. If you have somebody like my niece, where we're just not feeling it um, here, that doesn't mean that you don't use this. It still has its uses. It means that maybe you just want to use it in a different way. Does that make sense? As far as investments, uh, Carrie went through this. These are dead like question I get is, when is Bank of America going to open up their ABLE accounts? And the answer is never uh, here. This is always under the state treasurer's uh, office. So each one of them is different. There's a lot of differences. There's a lot of similarities. If you want to day trade with this money, this is not the way to do it. You can only uh, change the investments twice a year, nor should you change it more often than that. Okay. And as far as those investments, it's what's ever determined by the states. Uh, person with signature authority, um, here, the person with signature authority is not the equivalent of ownership because who owns the account? Bingo. And that's mostly a good thing. Okay, so um, so if we go back to this. Um, now, what is a QDE? And this is the, actually there's a, a blog going on right now about whether or not a Big Mac is a QDE. Uh, and I think it's a QDE. You know, a lot of this is still under development. Um, here because it doesn't specifically say food. The last one it says, and this actually came from something in some proposed regulations that says, well, ABLE is for basic living expenses. Somebody grabbed onto that and thought, well, we'll add that to the list. And so, and that's been accepted. You know, uh, this is in development. Could they back away from that? Possibly, but this is a real favorite amongst Congress um, when they actually do something uh, here. And so I don't think they're going to back off of this. Okay, so What's a QDE? I, you know, it's, it's easier just to try to figure out what is not a QDE. I think we all figured that gambling is not a QDE. Uh, I mean, there aren't a lot of things that are not QDEs. As far as the payback is concerned, we're not going to touch a whole lot on that. If you use a Cal Able uh, um, uh, account by law, and there's a question federally if you could do this, but my expectation is this is they're not going to back down from this. So if you use Cal Able for any Medi-Cal you've used from the time you set up the account, it's not going to be subject to the lien or the clawback or whatever they want to call it. Now, let's say you're a military family and you go to Virginia for a while with your Cal Able account and come back during that period. Virginia could make a claim. Okay, so it's not any Medicaid or Medi-Cal. Well, Medi-Cal is strictly California. So if you go out of state, there could be an issue. The thing about it, and we couldn't possibly cover everything in this, if the lien or the clawback is an issue, we have videos on that, and there may be a different way that she would use it. So I, I have some people that, like, under those circumstances, is the state of California going to get one set of my money, period, in the game um, here. And if that's your feeling, then there's ways of playing around it, okay? Housing, this is a big thing, okay? Um, and I actually was privileged to be, you know, on the call that probably triggered this, okay? Because here's the issue. On SSI, there's an example of somebody in their regulations where somebody inherits money and they prepaid their rent for like 30 months in advance and they didn't take this reduction in benefits, um, which I'll go through in a minute. And we actually got a chance to talk to the folks who wrote the SSI rules and said, well, with the Cal Able account, whose money is it? It's the beneficiary's money. So aren't they paying their food and shelter with their own money? Yes, so there shouldn't be a reduction. And, you know, it's funny. They said, well, we'll think about it. And the, lo and behold, when the rates came out, they said, yes, it's your, there, if you use it for food and shelter, it doesn't reduce benefits. What are we talking about the food and shelter thing real quick? On SSI, and we're only talking SSI. If your child's on childhood disability benefits, you don't need to worry about it. Okay. If they're on SSI and the general rate right now is $930.72, SSI, the federal part of the SSI is one third for food, one third for shelter, and one third for clothing we don't count any longer. So here's the concept. Let's say you have a child living in your house. Okay, we're going to go through the, uh, some examples in a minute. And the fair market value of living in your house is $1,500. You're going to have a really hard time with $932 paying 
fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, the federal government can do that, but we can't. Okay, because we're just people. So that was always the problem. And the thing is, if you assist your child with housing, and this is stupid then they reduce the benefits dollar for dollar for the assistance you're giving your child capped at one third of the federal part of the SSI, which is $270. We have a video that further explains it because if that makes any sense to you, you're probably crazy. Okay, I mean, but that's how it works, okay? And that's always been a problem. The parents are going, should we get a tax break? Should we get a thank you or something for helping our disabled child? No, your child gets a penalty. Well, here's the thing. If you pay for a shelter, and these are the things they count for shelter, okay? <laughs> Food and shelter in, um, here. If you pay for those things out of an ABLE account, you're paying it with their own money. Let's see how this plays out. Let's say Belinda has been disabled from birth and receives $910.72, okay? Because that's the wrong number there. Okay, <laughs> she's a, a beneficiary of a self-settled special needs trust. A self-settled special needs trust is a trust where she probably got money from like a uh, a lawsuit or an inheritance and it went directly to her. Doesn't matter what kind of trust it is. Okay, she'd like to move to a nicer apartment which would cost $1,000 a month. This is not in the Napa Valley, I'm here to tell you, okay? <laughs> She's gonna need some assistance to make this work because even if she could spend the 9, 10, 72, maybe she likes to eat, you know? And so we're gonna have a problem. So if Bob, her trustee, were to give her $1,000 a month directly, that's not going to work because that'll wipe out the SSI completely. If instead she were to pay the landlord directly, we're getting closer. And this is what we've always had to do. We would, uh, her benefits would be reduced by $272 or $270 a month. If instead she were to contribute $1,000 to her CalAble account and the CalAble account turn around to pay the rent, there's no reduction in benefits because she's using her own money, right? It's not a gift from Social Security, it's because she's using her own money. Let's just take this one step further, okay? Uh, this gets a little bit more involved. I will tell you, I spend half my time as the trustee of the Golden State Pool Trust. I spend the other half of my time as, a, as an attorney who does special needs planning. And I spend the other half of my time, I know this doesn't add up, doing a lot of advocacy work, and there's probably another half on top of it. The biggest issue I deal with with families is where will my child live? Second to nothing, okay? Where will my child live, okay? And that's what the North Bay Housing Coalition run by uh, Mary Apple over there is all about, and she's my boss, so you need to say nice things to her. Okay, so anyway. So here's an example of maybe a lot of families, if they have the money, are purchasing houses and do things, things like that. So Sue Casa uh, wants to provide her daughter, Mia uh, Casa, with a home to live in. Sue is concerned that if she puts the property in Mia's name, it's going to be subject to a lien. Okay, um, here. Additionally, if Mia were someday a unable to live in the home or she sold it, it would interfere with her benefits. Okay, so oftentimes, as we're going to see, we'll put the house in the trust. And we do this for a number of reasons, because if she moves, then she's going to have too much money and we're going to have all sorts of problems, lose her SSI and Medi-Cal. If Sue's unable to per Sue is able to purchase the home, and rather than title the home in Mia's name, she titles it into a third-party trust. That's an estate planning trust, okay? Now, here's what, the IR here's what Social Security says. It says that if a trustee of a special needs trust holds title to a home, uh, for the beneficiary, um, it isn't a resource to the beneficiary. Well, that makes sense. It's in the special needs trust. It would also not be a resource if the beneficiary moved from the house. Well, that okay. So far, so good. Now, the trust holds legal title to the house. Therefore, the eligible individual would be considered living in his or her own home based on a concept of equitable ownership under a trust. Now, as a trust attorney, that makes absolutely no sense to me. The Social Security says it's true, works, and I get the results I want, so it works on this. So here's what's going to happen, is that um, she's living in the house in the special needs trust, but they're going to treat her as if she owned it, even though she doesn't, and we don't have to charge her rent. Before these regulations came up, we would have to charge her fair market rent, which in today's world is impossible here and go back. So we're going to treat it so we don't have to charge her rent, so we're really cool, okay? So the individual does not get in-kind support and maintenance, meaning we don't have to take the $270 reduction. Um, and be, because um, we don't have to take the reduction. Okay, now... 
If the trust pays for other shelter items, because maybe she likes heat and electricity, it's possible uh, here. Uh, here. So if we pay for those other 10 things, well, now we've got a problem because um, unless she can pay it out of her own pocket, we're, and if the trust pays for it, we're going to take a reduction in benefits. So Mia can live in the house without having to pay rent because she has equitable ownership, but she's still going to have difficulty paying the taxes, utilities, without some assistance. So Sue Casa transfers enough funds into Mia's CalAble account, either monthly or annually, to help her pay for the taxes and utilities with no reduction in benefits because it's her money, right? And so that's one way of doing it. So she transfers enough into the third party trust here um, for Mia to continue making the contributions because her concern is what if, what if she passes away or what if she loses capacity herself? Um, here. So this is where the special needs trust comes in. They transfer enough money in the special needs trust where they're going to turn around and transfer funds into the CalAble account and pay the utilities. Both, Sue, uh, uh, both, uh, both of them feel uh, more secure and they feel like they have the best of both worlds. Uh, Sue has provided a residence to Mia and if she were unable to remain in the residence, the house could be sold and used for her other needs or maybe to buy down. You never know. Uh, if Mia were to get sued, the assets in the special needs trust are protected and the assets in the CalAble account are protected. So that's just an example um, here. Now, this is just our information. There's my um, email address and I know we're running out of time, but let me just tell you, for me, there have been three major uses I've used ABLE accounts for. One is the housing we went through it. Okay. The other one is teaching financial literacy, okay, and as a mode of distribution, okay. So a lot of the ABLE accounts we have, we just transfer money into it um, here, and uh, in fact, we have a case in the Central Valley Regional Center for you case workers out there. They got forty thousand dollars, okay. Uh, here we can't stick forty thousand dollars in a fifteen thousand dollar account. Even I can't do that. We put it in the uh, um, Golden State Pool Trust. And we transfer in that case, it's for a regional center, a Central Valley Regional Center client. We transfer about two or three hundred dollars a month into that account, and the caseworkers kind of oversee it, right? They're just to you know work on financial literacy, work it actually into the IPP, the whole thing uh, here, and we'll just keep transferring until the money's gone. The other one is um, uh, with that is that for somebody with capacity and the, that. Uh, Social Security says to Social Security workers they are not to question what this account is for with some limited, limited information. Now they want all the numbers from uh, CalAble, but they don't want to know what it's for. That is the IRS's problem. That's not Social Security's problem. Well, what does that mean? For me as the trustee, okay, I have to monitor every single distribution for every single beneficiary. I know what they eat. I know what they watch. I know what pornography they like, honest to God. Uh, here, stuff that is none of my damn business, to tell you the truth, uh, here, but I have to do it. In the ABLE account, in the CalABLE account, it's nobody's business. Now, that doesn't mean you should do and Once again, that's a good thing. Well, that could be a terrifying thing in the wrong situation. When you have somebody who's competent, because he wants to get for a number of my beneficiaries, I don't know what, I don't want to know what they spend their money on any more than I want them getting into my checking account. And having that level of, of, of autonomy is huge, right? So at least, you know, in a lot of the accounts where we're doing this, they have $50,000 a year they can do is say, damn well, please. And they don't have to ask their darn trustee what's good. The third one is that you can use it for a savings account um, here. So, you know, what is it? Is it a savings account? Is it a teaching account? It's oh, work. And of course we use it for work. And, and working is always a good thing, okay? Working is the avenue for independence for folks with disabilities. So really, as a Northern California liberal, even I, to me, I want to turn those people into taxpayers uh, here. And that is, the, that is the avenue to independence. By the way, for those of you that are considering folks working, there's a wonderful website. I will give you the long name, write the little short name down. It's called disabilitybenefits101.org or db101.org. 
wonderful website put on by the World Institute on Disabilities. It has calculators on working and all that so that your loved ones can go get a damn job. Okay, <laughs> You hear about you can't work. You can work. There's a cliff. They have calculators that tell you where the cliff is so you can get to the edge of the cliff. Don't go over the cliff until you're ready. And for some folks, going over the cliff is a wonderful day that, you know, all that. Anyway, we don't have enough time to do justice to this. We're done. We are officially over. I'm going to stay until they run me out of here. If folks have questions, please make sure if you do are interested in sending send you an email with links and videos and stuff like that. Please I just do wanted that. to mention too, um, over on the table over there are some enrollment packets. So an enrollment guide, we have a trifle for a shore. So if you do want some more information about Kelly, well, you can find that on the table over the site. Any questions real quick? I'd like to know the uh, the AB number. Four one six. AB four one six. Why don't we start from the front? You and Emily will just work our way down. Um, I have a special needs trust, and um, I have a disability that started when I was twenty two, but it's a mental health disability. Yes. I don't keep records, so my psychiatrist is willing to write a letter. Here's how easy this is. Assuming you didn't have, and if it's okay to share, yeah. this young lady here, uh, her disability began before the age of 26, but you didn't get benefits before 26? That's correct. Okay, so is she out? No. Okay, and it's like a lot of folks with mental health, behavioral health issues, it's not like magically, it's only in the movies that you're okay one day and the next day, you know, you have a, a diagnosis. It takes time, and it's rare that it doesn't start before the age of 26. All you need is a doctor, and this is how loose it is. All you need is a doctor's letter that in all likelihood you would have met the definition of the disability. Now, what do you do with that? You put it in a safe place, and then you certify that you have it. You're done. You qualify. Piece of cake. Yeah. Wait, yes, ma'am. Yes. Just want to introduce Caleb Rogan. He's the executive director of the Hi, Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. I told her not to interrupt, but now, <laughs> now we already did, so too late. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, do you have to inform SSDI when you make an account for someone and Medicare? Well, know? first off, two things. For SSDI, it doesn't make any difference at all. So if you reported it, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Okay. Uh, do you have to report it? No, but there is a reporting that goes on, and she knows more about that than I do. Okay. Yeah, so the individual states are instructed to, on a monthly basis, upload just a, um, an accounting of each person's balance mm -hmm. to the Social Security Administration, and that's it. Okay. That's all. And so the onus is not on you to do any contacting or reporting. Oh, okay. No. Easy peasy. Yes, sir. And then we'll you. A number of clients that have special needs trusts, but they're pretty specific and limited as to what they'll pay out. They're probably less limited than you think um, here. So it depends on the trust. By the way, just as an aside, I'm always happy to look at the no charge and tell you. Here's the thing that happens if you have an existing trust. So two things. It may not be as limited as you think, but the issue with it even so is that if you pay for housing, you're going to take the reduction on SSI and all that. But here's the next thing that comes up. Do you need to modify that to allow the use of an ABLE account? And the answer is no. Okay. Unless the account is under court supervision. If it's under court supervision, you don't do anything without the judge saying it's okay. If it's just an estate planning trust you set up, um, I've never seen language. The language in the trust now almost universally will say that you can use an ABLE account. Do you have to have it? No. I mean, but if you're just itching to give some money to the attorney to amend your trust, you're welcome. So the recipient of the special needs trust can just call the, the trustee and say, look, I want to set up your ABLE account. Right. You <clears throat> might even want to want, uh, send them the link to the video I'm going to send you um, here where we almost broke the internet uh, here talking about um, how you can tie that in with a special needs trust. So that may be foreign to what your trustee thinks. So we have lots of materials on that. Yeah, these are very complementary tools. I mean, in most cases we advocate, you know, they will come straight, but you're going to want your special yeah. needs trust. Yeah. It's kind of an add-on. Yeah. You had a question and then, then you. Yeah, and actually I was watching one of your webinars, and, and something that I, that someone said in it, either you or one of the people presenting with you, that I thought was, you know, very, I mean, I worked in all the things like that, but I don't think about this stuff, is um, sometimes special needs trust 
could be income producing, and people with um, social security income or benefits get something in the mail, and all of a sudden their benefits stop, and they don't understand why. The Social Security Administration is saying there's money that's coming in. So I, something they mentioned in your thing, just be mindful, you know, about if there's anyone in your family or if you, you know, are a recipient of that. Yeah, yeah I, you know, here's the thing you have to look at. Able accounts are tools. Specialty stress are tools, right? We shouldn't be hawking commodities. I shouldn't be hawking trust. She shouldn't be hawking accounts. We're selling solutions. That's what we're doing. And if it makes sense for you, then if, a, if an able account makes more sense for your loved one than a specialty trust altogether, that's what you ought to do. If a specialty trust makes more sense and the able just doesn't fit, well, that's what you ought to do. We're seeing more and more folks where they're getting both. You know, what's the right thing in your own situation? It goes back to Brian Rubin. If you've met one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. That depends on the situation. Um, here, I love the freedom it gives my beneficiaries if they can show me that they can handle that. I, that I, I enjoy. Yes, ma'am. I have uh, two questions. First one is um, in terms of a qualified disability expense. What about travel, like a trip to Disneyland or something? So that's something you wouldn't want to save for if it's expensive. This is something in development. Okay, now my feeling is, well, so going to Disneyland, because we're on the West Coast, right? Disney World, if you're watching on the other side uh, here. Um, you could pay for transportation. You could pay for the Mickey Mouse hat, right, uh, yourself. And, if, and this is where the card is going to be really important, because you go back to my niece. She has a card with the program. She saw it. She couldn't possibly. I, it's hard for me to imagine her using checks. But, you know, yeah, once again, she may exceed my expectations. It could pay for all those things. And here's the next thing that comes up. She could pay for companion care. Is a QDE paying for her friend to go? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're getting a little fuzzier. The I hotel, don't know. The, the hotel, hotel definitely. A few years ago, it was $1,200. And frankly, we just squirreled money away. Yeah, well, you could squirrel money away in the account, right? So you could do that and then legitimately pay your hotel bill? Or oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That That is on. You know, I would count QDEs as there's the hard... The hard QDEs, the ones where the words are up there, and then there's the soft QDEs. The hard QDEs are the things on that list. But do we stop there? No, because I'm having a hard time finding out what is not a QDE. Everybody agrees gambling is not a QDE. Okay? I mean, where the Napa Valley is wine a QDE? Quality of life. Yeah. I have a question. So my son receives, um, what is it? The, he's a, his, his father passed away. So he's on childhood disability benefits. Right. He's not on SSI. Because his, his benefit is higher, he is on working disabled med accounts that still has that in, that resources limit. So how does that fit in? He's it would not be. Side. So what she's talking about is a wonderful program called the 250% Working Disabled uh, program. The name is much too long uh, here, but it's a way that her her son has exceeded um, the amount of income he can earn and get traditional Medi-Cal. So this is a way for paying pennies on the dollar for your Medi-Cal. Great program and all of that. Um, will the able account affect the um, uh, affect the two hundred fifty percent working disabled program? No. So the absolutely not. Maximum amount you can have is not applicable if that money is in that uh, table account. Right. Okay. Exactly. And you can use this is something that that you could do a whole program on this. Um, there's a worker savers <laughs> program. So if he doesn't have a 401k or an IRA, you can use it. You know, you can get some of the benefits that you would do with the normal 401k. He can actually save for his future. And that sort of thing. This is where DB101 is a wonderful website, and you should definitely bookmark it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? How about you and then you in the back? Uh, the self certification. I've By the way, we're officially over, so I didn't. What, oh, she's not. She may be coming. I You're not really rude if you started not applying for a Cal Able account, and when I reached out to staff, they quoted me regularly really deal with the substance of my question, which is what has to be in the self-certification letter that the doctor signs. 
as far as I can tell, it's the beneficiary has X diagnosis, medically determined, okay. onset prior to age 26, mm -hmm. results in a marked or severe functional limitation and maybe quote from the blue book. Sure. But I wasn't getting any concrete advice on what um, needs yeah. to go. Yeah, we don't have a template letter. That is something, I mean, most states don't. Are you aware? No, I'm actually working on a template. Everybody myself. seems to tap dance around federal legislation language. Yeah, I think you're dance. really just saying here's what the disability is uh, mm -hmm. prior to age 26. Okay. That's, so do you, that's the consensus I tend to hear. Do you have a, an answer? Yeah. Because um, you have to put in a So Oregon, Oregon, for example, does have, we do have, you know, it's not ours, but when we were researching this, Oregon does have a template letter that they gave folks. So okay. I'd be happy to share that with you if you want to contact me directly, but I, I don't think there's any standard for this. Most licensed physicians, and I've dealt with this with people who are, are receiving cash aid for their families and they suddenly have a disability and they can't participate in the welfare work program. Most licensed physicians do not like to standardize template of what they need to be saying because their licenses are on the line. So Here's the biggest problem I've run into, and I'm working well, actually on. Doesn't even know label exists. So I mean, I'm asking them. For Here, a here's, here's, yeah. Actually, it's pretty damn loose. Uh, I mean, actually, just a letter from the IRS that says, in all likelihood, would have met the definition of being disabled for yeah. Social Security purposes. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Here's the problem that I've run in with some physicians, and in the law it says you can't do this. They're concerned that you're going to turn around and use this letter and use it to try to get on SSI or SSDI. The law specifically says you can't. They just don't want to get into that quagmire. So the letters that I've been having my clients give is, would you please do this? Johnny has schizophrenia. We all know that he didn't get his benefits until he was 30, but we all know that he didn't magically become disabled at age 30. It doesn't work like that. Would you write us a letter? Um, something a little more professional, and oh, by the way, it's against the law to use this letter to try to get on SMTI and SSI. Because the problem we've resistance we've had is they don't want to be involved in this, and I don't blame them. Right? All right. Any last questions? You had one in the back. Yes. Yeah, related to this question, there has to be a letter from a physician, medical physician, psychologist, PhD. My understanding is it has to be a physician. I know there's something odd in there. There's a yeah. faith healer, isn't there? Licensed physician or, oh God, the term is Does a psychiatrist have an MD? Yes, yeah. a psychiatrist would. Yeah. They're, they're, they're doctors. Yes. Right. I used to be there's a psychiatrist. There's another term, and I Yeah, there's, there's one other term. Yeah, it's a like three right years. Neurologist? No, it, it actually has to do, I think, with. Um, Clinician? No. No. It, 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 it specifically if you ever it. read it, it, it has yeah. to do with with a type of faith healer. I'm not talking about. <laughs> I, I'm not talking. Yeah. I'm, if the person has a medical spiritual. Yes. Spiritual. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is. I. We can look it up. We, for you. we really want to know. You can get it so you 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 had a question. You can't get it from your homeopath. It, you know, it's got to be somebody with lots of letters. After. I've had two cases where we just couldn't get the letters. Yeah. I, and, yeah. you know, it's kind of sad. And unfortunately, that person could have really, one in particular, could have really used it. And, you know, just there's just a certain point where you just can't go any further. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my question I wanted to ask actually was um, uh, regarding the QDI, QDE. 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 Thank you. Um, I wanted to know if there's any standard that requires you to have a QDE. 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 QDE.
Um, and I have a class I teach called Wacky Things the IRS Does When There's a Disabled Person Involved. And what I do with my students is I'll go through, well, if we had this tax situation and this came up, what do you think the IRS would do? And then they, they give the answer, go, see what happens when we throw somebody in there with Down syndrome and let's see what happens. And they just throw all the rules out the window. I've got a sneaky suspicion that some of the people that write this, maybe they have disabled children or children with disabilities, you know, and all of that. And they come up with the wackiest stuff. Well, here's the thing. The IRS has traditionally been a disability friendly group. So when I'm looking at things where it's social security, my feeling, and this is just me, Maybe the treasurer's office doesn't feel the same. You cannot be too paranoid when you're dealing with Social Security. It is not possible. When you're dealing with the IRS, it is the absolute opposite end of the spectrum. There are some arguments that some of the ABLE advocates have um, are a little bit on the loose side and some of the things they've done, like can you really eliminate the, the clawback? If this was Social Security, under no circumstances, there's an argument that you can't do it anyway do I think it's going to get taken back? No, and the reason is, it's the IRS. The Department of Treasury is not interested in pissing off parents of disabled children uh, here. It did have one of the highest bipartisan participants. This is a favorite of Congress. Mm -hmm. And did they all understand what they were signing? No, but they signed it, mm -hmm. right? And they're behind it. And they're all, and by the way, I get, I get all sorts of Google alerts and everybody who's up for um, a re-election is like they all uh, supported the ABLE Act, so are they going to do anything to hurt this thing? No, right? So um, what is not a QDE? I'm not 100% sure. And then here's the other thing, and I would never tell you not to follow the rules. Why you would? In order to get pot. You would have to be audited by the IRS. For those of you who have children on SSI, how many times have your children been audited? They'd have to be audited by the IRS. They would have to have somebody who has really read up on this. There, I don't think we're going to see any cases. We're not going to see anything on this. I bet you we're going to go a decade before we see anything about this. I think that in most cases, as long as you don't do something incredibly wacky, like, for instance, gambling is probably is over the top. You know, uh, here, but can you use it to buy pornography? I don't know, but I seriously doubt if there's a problem with it, right? I mean, the question we come up with is can you use it for cannabis, or we call it medicine, uh, here? It's legal in California, it's not legal for the feds. Is that okay? I don't know. Um, but the other thing with it is if you actually calculate the penalty, the 10% penalty isn't what you think it is. It's 10% of the earnings balanced over the period of the lifetime of the account. The, the penalty for, let's say you bought $100 um, in marijuana. I don't even know. CBD oil. Okay. The, the, let's say you did that, and the IRS says, no, 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 you can't do that. The penalty would probably be so laughable, it would be just ridiculous, you know. So, and according to the regulations on Social Security, um, they're, they're not going to disqualify you because what it says is you are not to question what this thing is used for with some bizarre things having to do with transferring money out of your account and holding it uh, for a period of time. So, I, other than that, um, the, IRA, the Social Security says keep your bloody hands off of this thing, which is okie dokie with me. It's a free pass, but you should follow the rules. <laughs> yes, but why you would, I don't know. So, for example, yes. the doctor prescribed uh, for my son a CBD oil for anxiety. Okay, so that's legal because the doctor, you know, and it's legal in California. So, if I well, ask Donald money, Trump, so if I take that money from a government account. Are they is IRS gonna like question me for that? Your risk is that big. Okay. okay, and even for cannabis oil, let's say you become the premier case. <laughs> What's your last name? Dunstan. Dunstan. So it'd be Dunstan versus the Department of Treasury. So maybe you become the leading case. So that go through the whole thing, and the penalty will be a buck and a half. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I mean, it just. 
That doesn't mean we shouldn't follow the rules, but, no, but we should follow the rules. No, but it's prescribed by his doctor. Right. So if you can help him, it's quality of life. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I have a question. Um, if uh, my daughter has an SSI account and an ANCO account, and um, if she, like, we don't, and she's very impacted with autism, so you know, I can't everything. If um, I called, a, actually, I called, I think, Cal Abel and asked him this because it seemed funny to me, but I did it, went ahead and did it anyway. Um, if, if we have money in her SSI, that's, you, you know, we haven't spent it down. Can we put that in her ANCO account? You can, but here's the only thing. And, and, and let's go even further with it. Can you put the SSI money in it? You can't put it directly in, but you could receive it and put it in the account. Let's say you work. Okay. Could she work and put the money in the account? Yes. Is it still income? Yes. Okay. But it doesn't become a resource, so she can build up past the $2,000 resource. You can put SSI money you can't put it in directly because federal law says it can only go into a certain account. But you can you can put it in an ABLE account. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. You could transfer it to ABLE. Oh, as the rep payee, can you? Yeah, as the rep payee. I already did it. And they said it, they said it was okay, but it feels weird to me. I don't know how the only it. thing you're going to have is a rep payee. And for those of you that don't know what a rep payee is, that's the person who has, who's managing the Social Security account. She really I don't think they're as concerned about where you put it as what you did that's with what it. They said. That's what, what they're really concerned about is, are you somehow making a profit off your daughter? Which, by the way, if you are, tell me how you're doing it so I can... <laughs> you know. It's just, I mean, it's like, let's say she chooses through her, she chooses through, on her daughter's account, she chooses through her dresses a lot like that. You know, yeah. let her go, you know. A couple of months with chewy dresses, or buy her like perfectly clean yeah. dresses every month. And I'm thinking, well, why don't I just let her, you know, have imperfect dresses and put hundred, two hundred dollars, whatever, in her table? <laughs> see, I don't, I don't see a problem with that. You're going to have the same level of accountability for that. But, but yeah, I keep, well, you know. Yeah, I don't see a problem with. It. Was there another question? And then we probably need to go in five minutes because I could do this all day. <laughs> Um, did you, you had a question, ma'am? I just wondered what the MCLE series. The MCLE series. Um, this is a series for attorneys. This is a good area. It, it's kind of dumbed down for attorneys. So unless you're an attorney, I'm sorry about that. But the uh, we have a, the, the part of the MCLE series. We just did a program uh, on the basics of IPPs. Uh, it's for attorneys, but it's at a level everybody can understand. The next one we have, so if you gave us your email, you're going to get a link to this, is we're doing some something on the basics of the ADA. We just did something on the basics of IEPs. These are programs we're using to teach attorneys and trustees things they ought to know if they're serving this population. We have programs on all sorts of things. I think with that, uh, I, I do want to mention one other thing about Cal Able. They're very, they're very available to talk with you. They actually pick up the phone. They even pick it up when I call uh, here. And the other thing is the board is very interested. So if you're running into problems, they want to know. And they're real easy to get a hold of. If you go to their website, you can sign up for their newsletter. You can attend their programs online. This is a new program in development. You know, I'm, I'm sure Carrie is here to teach you, but she's also here to learn from you. This is a new, bright, shiny object. We're all trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, here and the more input you have, the better program we're going to have. Absolutely. Carrie, you get the last word. No, that's it. Feel free to contact us anytime. Again, my contact information is in the PowerPoint. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.